Thursday afternoon, 6 p.m. in Central Europe is Space Cafe Canada time. Our Space Cafe Canada by Dr. Jessica West with her guest James Sleepers will begin very soon. As always, we really appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback, and we will learn and improve based on your feedback. I am Elena Vocale, Event Coordinator at Spacewatch Global. Spacewatch Global is a Europe-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I would like to thank all our private and corporate supporters uh, who are committed to, keep, to keeping our independent journalism alive. We really appreciate that. If you want to be part of the supporters team, it is just a click away from you on our website. I know many of you are familiar with our website, our daily and, bi and bi-weekly newsletters, and the Space Cafe podcast. Don't miss the latest uh, episodes, which features um, Nico uh, Colon, a renowned NASA astrophysicist and expert in exoplanet exploration, uh, for a thought-provoking episode on the future of uh, space exploration. We also have new episodes of Space Cafe Radio, uh, featuring Roald Verdu uh, from PLD Space about their maiden flight, and another episode with Cecilia Donati and Savino Rua about the recent New Space Africa conference. Our fan shop is also open for you on our website, and it is a nice way for you to become a space watcher. If you missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our webpage in the event section, and of course, you can find us on YouTube. We will host our Space Cafe Canada Live regularly. With that, my job is done, and I'd like to hand over to your host today. Jessica, over to you. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Space Cafe Canada. I'm here joining you from Project Plowshares, a Canadian peace and security research institute that has been engaged in space governance discussions for the past two decades now, which is hard to believe. Uh, we're located at the University of Waterloo, on the Haldeman Tract, uh, which is land granted to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River, itself part of the territory of the Neutro, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. Now joining me today is James Sleepers, co-founder and CEO of Skywatch, which is also based here in Waterloo Region. Um, our region is very well known for many tech-related things, and I'm guessing at least one person in the audience has seen the new Blackberry movie. Uh, but the space sector isn't often top of mind when we think about Waterloo. So I'm hoping that today's discussion can help raise awareness, not only about space and exciting things in space, but also about this region as a growing hub uh, for investments and activities that are all space related. James co-founded Skywatch as, a, as software to allow astrophysicists to have near real-time access to data from NASA's space observatories. And for that, he won the NASA Space Apps Challenge in 2014. And then Skywatch turned its gaze back down to Earth and the space startup industry. Today, Skywatch is one of the leading service providers of satellite imagery, and it has a mission to make Earth observation data accessible to the world. I'm guessing James is well known to many people in the audience. Uh, in addition to his continued leadership at Skywatch, he has a long track record of supporting and promoting Canada's new space economy, as well as mentoring students and startups. James remains involved in hackathons such as the Space Apps Challenge, uh, numerous industry associations, Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, or SEDS, and as a mentor to the Creative Destruction Lab Space Stream and an advisor to the Institute for Earth and Space Exploration at Western University, which I want to point out is where our previous guest, Hira Nadim, has just finished her master's degree. Uh, so definitely something that's on our radar. Uh, as a side note, I first encountered but did not meet James at a distance at, I think, the last in-person Canadian Space Summit before the pandemic, uh, an event that Skywatch had generously sponsored. I was watching from a distance and I have to say, I don't think I managed to make my way up to say hello in person because there was such a crowd of people uh, wanting to say hi to James. And so I'm really excited to have him on the show here today. Thank you for taking the time to discuss Skywatch and your mission of bringing space back down to earth. Thanks, Jessica, appreciate the introduction. Um, and, and agree with you that we should make Waterloo a region well known for space technology, not only commercial space, but um, we have organizations like yours, as well as the Perimeter Institute and many others that are um, doing really interesting things. But as usual, for a small Canadian town, we're, we're understated in uh, the great things that we're doing. 
Yes. Also quantum space. I hope to dive into that in another episode so, at some point. Totally at IQC as well. Yes. Uh, so James, to dive in, I guess more about you and what brought you to space. And that might that might lead us into the impetus for the uh, the, the original idea behind Skywatch. Uh, absolutely. So uh, as you mentioned, we built a piece of software uh, originally called Skywatch for uh, astrophysicists and astronomers, allowing them to get uh, access to data from NASA's uh, a number of NASA space observatories in near real time. And uh, that was certainly, uh, it was a side project of ours and a, and a couple of friends uh, to using NASA's open data. And, and I think this is a very important thing that NASA did that you know the Canadian Space Agency is starting to do as well, which is to try to make their data and their infrastructure as widely accessible as possible. So uh, as many people around the world who have an interest in space can participate in building interesting solutions. Um, and that's how we got involved. And I've always been uh, I've always been fascinated with uh, space more on the uh, not necessarily uh, a Trekkie um, or or a huge Star Wars fan, which is which will be shocking to many. But um, I, I was always a Carl Sagan fan um, and, and fascinated with the cosmos. Uh, cosmology and, and and astronomy and astrophysics more on the science side of space and um when i found out that nasa was making their data from these these spacecraft widely available for people to build applications on um it sort of merged to two passions that i had uh, which was building software and um and participating in, in the space ecosystem uh, and so through that, we we won an award for the work that we did back in 2014, as you mentioned. Uh, but I think more importantly, and I think this is why it's such an important initiative, it gave us a window into how the space ecosystem works. We learned about ground stations, about the launch industry, about new satellites, how they're built, how they transmit data. And that became really fascinating to us. And I think gave us the, the foundation of knowledge that we needed to eventually move into Earth observation. Um, but that was that was originally how how, how Skywatch came about. Um, NASA's Open Data Initiative, I, I think, played a huge role in getting us not only interested in space, but also allowing us to participate in a way that probably wasn't possible um, just a few years prior prior to that. That's a great story. And the U.S. just launched a new space diplomacy strategy, which is a whole other conversation. But I noticed they have doubled down on free and open access to U.S. government satellite data. And I thought that was mm -hmm. really key. So a side project <laughs> to winning the Space Apps Challenge to a company focused on making EO or Earth observation data accessible to everyone. How, how does that next jump happen? Yeah, well, the, the funny thing is that uh, I always joke that astrophysics is a labor of love and not not uh an industry in which you make money um and uh the, the, the fact was as we were, we were thinking about it, i was fairly young at my time i was i was in my early 20s and uh we were thinking about what we wanted to do with our careers um and we were getting a lot of media attention as well as investor attention for for the work that we were doing and uh the, and, and this is also around the time where uh spacex had not yet relanded a rocket but it, they were starting to gain notoriety in the in the mainstream media, not just within those of us who were paying attention to space. So it was an exciting time. I, I actually thought maybe we were late to the space industry, and and, and the commercialization had already passed us. Uh, I feel I feel like a grandfather now, eight nine years later uh, in, in in this industry. But uh, um, but we 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 realized there was a, an emerging opportunity in Earth observation because we. We were starting to read the headlines that companies were raising capital to launch dozens, if not hundreds, of satellites. And what became pretty obvious was that they didn't, they weren't talking too much about, we were talking about the capability of going to space, but we weren't talking about the benefits that we could bring to people here on Earth with, with those, those capabilities. And I think every, I, <laughs> I think every startup founder, most startup founders, are a little bit naive, um, and I'd put myself in that bucket too, because starting a company is usually a very irrational decision. And um, and we believed, probably naively, that, oh, we feel like we solved this problem in astrophysics. Um, we're just going to turn the cameras around 180 degrees, point them back at Earth, and it's essentially the same problem and the same opportunity. 
but people will pay for this. And, um, and, and so thus our, our endeavors in Earth observation began uh, somewhat naively. But again, one doesn't really jump into something extremely difficult unless they have an irrational belief that they can solve the problem. Yes, a little bit of naivety might be good for, for motivation and, and gumption at the beginning. Um, so why would we do? I mean, was that a choice or is that kind of like, like my organization, Project Plushers, it's kind of more happenstance than a, than a strategic choice. And yet I feel as though it's been a wonderful place for us to be. Yeah, well, Skywatch actually started in Toronto. Um, and uh, we were looking for a startup technology community that we could be a part of in building Skywatch. And in 2014, Google was running a, a program, an incubator program, essentially, uh, called Google for Entrepreneurs, in which they were offering $100,000 of um, computing credits, mentorship from some uh, executives there in the organization and uh, in office space. And um, and we we applied to get in in uh, in September of, of 2014. Uh, luckily, I think maybe 100 companies or so, six were selected. And we found actually we, it was it was in August. We found out, I think, August 29th or 30th, we were in the program and I was living in Waterloo September 2nd, um, having really not known anybody in Waterloo. And I thought for sure we'd be here for six months and we would go back to Toronto. And um, we really fell in love with the community here. I always say it's a, uh, it has a, a, a small town vibe to it, which I like. I, I grew up in a small town, but a, a very big city intellect and ambition. And, and so it sort of matched these two things that I was looking for in a community. Uh, and, uh, and not to mention when you're building a company and uh, you don't have any money, uh, cost of living is quite important as well. And uh, being able to 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 start a company here in, in Kitchener, Waterloo compared to, to Toronto um, was much more cost effective and and put less stress on, on the finances for sure. But yeah, I, I still live here eight years later and have a family here now and don't have any plans of, of leaving. Good. I think I think we benefit from having companies like yours here part of the tech ecosystem. Um, so I really like the mantra of bringing space back down to earth um, and sort of communicating that message is something that I, I struggle with um, in my in my own work. Um, and I really enjoy listening to the, the podcast Terranauts. I'm, I'm assuming you've heard it, um, but it talks about all of the people and capabilities on earth that make human space flight, uh, human space flight possible. So they are the, the ones that go to space all the time without ever leaving the planet. And you talked about how at the time you were you were starting up the, the company when there was a huge focus on commercial actors putting putting things into space. Um, and obviously we've been putting a lot of things into space over the last few years, but Skywatch seems different. Um, Skywatch seems to be more earth focused, more like a, a Terra space company. Um, and so how do you how do you think of yourself as a space company that isn't maybe physically in space as much as some of the others are? And is this the future of commercial commercial space as well? Not not just having satellites or launching satellites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good question. So I, I like your term Terra space, too. I think that's a it's a it's a, it's a good mix. Of Ian. Yeah, yeah, you should. Uh, and yeah, I'm familiar with Terra Knots and, and know Ian Christie well, and he's really passionate about the topic. The, uh, what I would say, so, so, you know, one thing is maybe I'll give a little bit of uh, insight into how Skywatch thinks of itself in the value chain of Earth observation. Um, if you think about Earth observation, we got hundreds of these satellites, uh, these sensors that are in orbit. Uh, they have to communicate down through ground stations, which eventually have to go through these data processing pipelines and into uh, usually cloud storage systems, and then some sort of mechanism needs to be built to enable people to uh, procure, buy, and order data from wherever that data is sitting, and then has to go out to. Um, usually, it goes not directly to end users. So, if we think about a farmer, for example, that's using satellite data, um, it, the 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 company or the persons that are usually procuring this data are there is some intermediary that is building a very vertical specific application. In, in the case of agriculture, 
It would be like a, an ag tech company that builds farm management information services. Um, they, they build various types of software that the farmers use. And so they procure this data. So, so it's, a quite, it's a quite long and complex value chain. And Skywatch is building software uh, almost along the entire value chain, all the way from uh, the, uh, the actual satellite in space uh, so, so we actually do, as of this year, we, we do build software that is in space, a uh, product called TerraStream Edge, which will allow, uh, which allows our satellite partners to easily um, process and analyze their imagery on the spacecraft so they can determine if it fits the customer's needs before paying to downlink it to the ground. Um, <laughs> just a small note about that, about... Uh, 95, this is something you only learn when you get in the industry, 95% of all pixels that we send to the ground don't get monetized, um, which means we, we send a lot of wasteful data down the ground simply because um, we're not, we're, we're unsure about the quality historically of the data as it sits there in orbit and is captured. And so we're, we're thinking more and more as an industry and Skywatch in particular, about how to put that software in space to do that analysis. Um, but we help we help analyze the imagery right there on the spacecraft. Um, we don't do any of the operations, so we don't operate the satellite. We don't build mission operations. Uh, we don't build ground stations or any of the software that, that sits on the ground station, but we integrate with those partners and we build the data processing pipelines and as well as a lot of the um, the software and the algorithms that uh, speak to the mission control software as well as the ground station to help automate the need for um, imagery requests to go up as well as uh, for the imagery to come back down. Uh, we process the imagery to a final product. We store it. We build data management and distribution software for, um, for our satellite operators. An analogy we like to use is it's Shopify for space companies. Um, I like that. A, a very, very simple way for you as an operator to do the things that are non-core competency to your business, which is data management, customer management, order management, and, and to simplify that and, and, and allow you to focus on uh, serving customers as well as building high quality hardware and data products. Um, and then we also build the distribution mechanisms, which is the APIs that allow companies uh, around the world as well as other pieces of software in a machine to machine manner to easily order the data that they need um, and, and receive it back once once it's uh, procured. Um, and then we're, we're actually just rolling out next month, uh, actually within actually this month, now that we're in June, uh, enterprise application, which now is starting to extend all the way to the end user. But it's um, what we realized is as we made it simpler for uh, more and more very large organizations to access lots of Earth observation data, we created a new problem for those businesses, which is that they all of a sudden were procuring this data for the first time and they didn't know how to procure it properly in their organization amongst hundreds of users. They didn't know how to share it, how to comply with the licensing. Um, so we're building now tools and now we've created a problem in these organizations now where they have, they have sort of an abundance of riches of, of data coming in from space. And now they have a, a data management problem inside their, or, their own organization that we're helping uh, to solve for and, be, and we'll be rolling out. So as you can see there, software all the way from in space to, to the end user and partnering with the providers along that value chain that build the hardware and the components um, that allow data to flow through that system. You've been answering all of the questions I've been thinking about, um, but I might take a step back. I mean, we're using the term earth observation data. So what kind of imagery are you working with? Is it the the full range, and what is that? Or yeah, uh, and what kind of companies? Uh, I suppose you know. on the what kind of companies on the uh, consumption side or the supply side? Supply. We'll get to consumption soon. Supply side, yeah. So so suppliers. Um, we, uh, you know, I, I'm, we're really proud that Skywatch provides access to more satellites right now than any other organization in the world. I should say. EO satellites. Um, we work with um, and, and have contractual access to pretty close to 95% of all the Earth observation satellites that are in orbit today and active. And, and so, yeah, our, our Earth observation data 
runs the spectrum of what's available all the way from your um your 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 uh visible wavelengths although soon uv which will be interesting we've only really used uv historically for um for astronomy and there's some interesting uv applications that are starting to be thought about um for for earth observation and then all the way through your infrareds um microwave and and radio wavelengths um and so we always like to think that you know the, the wavelength at which you look at the earth can really really dictates the information you can glean from it and um and, and i think you know as you, as you think about the electromagnetic spectrum it's it's so um wide with options i i think we're only cutting the um we're really just touching the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's possible um in earth observation i really feel like it's 2003 in the gps industry like that's how early we are in this in this like the iphone hasn't been invented yet so to speak okay but you might be the iphone uh, yeah, like I think the, the what we think about is what made GPS really, um, really take off was this um, standardization, this accessibility, and this affordability, and tons of GPS companies emerged that sort of helped helped that standardization and allowed companies like Apple um, and others to easily integrate those those capabilities into their software. And we see ourselves as that middle layer, like. We're, we're, we're really an infrastructure company at the end of the day. Our, our, our mission is to make Earth observation as important to our daily lives as GPS has been over the last couple of decades. And we truly believe it can be either as impactful, if not more impactful. Um, GPS, you know, just to give you a comparison, it's, a, it's close to an $80 billion a year industry, but with trillions of dollars of, um, of goods and services that just would absolutely fail if, if that network went out. And um, Earth observation today is, you know, quite minuscule in comparison. It's a few billion dollar industry, um, of which with maybe another ten ish or so billion dollars of of goods and services that rely on it on a day to day basis. But it has the potential to be much more. It just suffers from having the inverse characteristics of GPS. It's very fragmented historically, uh, very inaccessible, and very unaffordable. But that's a great point about GPS. Um, you know, I, I mostly work in security. And so we always talk about, you know, a day without space. And we use that to try to wake people up to the, the value of space and its fragility. Um, and it's always focused on GPS primarily because, as you said, it's so integrated. Um, now, with EO, you said it's kind of the, we're at the tip of the iceberg on how that data can be used and integrated into daily life around the world, uh, what are some of the ways that that it is being used? So I guess I'm going to have two questions. One might be some of your end users, so the other side of the companies that you work with, um, but also the, the uses more broadly. How How is this helpful for humanity? Because that mm -hmm. is part of your mission. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think the, the, the core, we're doing this because, you know, it's part of our mission and our vision to make the world a better place. We, we we believe in the fundamental principle that we invest in space technology to make Earth better. And I think that's always the, the best um, motivator for continued investment in space technology. And, and I think like you don't have to look any further than, um, you know, I, 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 I'm not a, um, I don't have a, a, a PhD in this history, but I, I, do, I, I do sort of fundamentally believe that I don't think we'd be as advanced in our understanding of um, our climate and dangers we've been doing to it if it were not for space technology, if it were not for some of the decisions and investments we made in the 70s um, to start to look at our planet through through that lens. Um, and, and so I, I, you know, it's core to what we do. If, if we can make this data available to more people, more people will find um, useful um, and helpful applications that, that help make the planet a better place. Now, in terms of the use cases, um, they're they're very they're varied. So we serve um, over the last twelve months, we probably served a little bit more than twelve hundred organizations with commercial data, um, probably up to three thousand ish uh, organizations with with data. Just generally speaking, whether it was commercial or not, and uh, the, the use cases are varied. Like there, there's hundreds of them. They are. Uh, across, we've served more than 24 different verticals and markets in more than 50 different countries. And so 
it, it's actually a, that that's the hardest part I think about building the Skywatch business is you don't have a single uh, customer profile or persona in mind when you're building the business. It, it's quite broad and varied. So what we spend a lot of time doing is trying to understand what are the common characteristics and user behaviors across all those markets and verticals. And I think like, we've landed on what I think is a very simple value proposition, uh, not for us, so somewhat for us, but mo mostly for satellites, which is that a satellite is the fastest and most affordable way to get information about any location on the planet. So our customers, uh, they generally need information about some location on the planet, and they're trying to decide if a satellite can ascertain that information for them. Um, whether it is, um, it, it generally means monitoring something. So, so one thing that uh, is very different about Skywatch compared to many other uh, downstream applications that you might see that look similar is that Skywatch actually primarily does 90% of its transactions are, are tasking a satellite to capture something for our customers. We're not a, um, we don't, a lot of our business, a very small part of our business is actually enabling people to access existing archives. 90% um, of our business is thinking about how can somebody um, monitor a field every, every few days, um, monitor a natural disaster, monitor some remote infrastructure, whatever it is that they need to monitor. We want it to be as easy as pushing a few buttons on your phone and our job as an infrastructure company is to figure out what satellites are best suited to, to, to solve that problem for you without you needing to know anything about satellites or a satellite company. Um, but but the, the core of what we enable is you need to monitor something. So we've done some really cool stuff. We've, we've done things you've heard about, like we monitor uh, fields, uh, agriculture fields, uh, farms. We, we, we monitor a lot of remote infrastructure. Uh, but we like we we get really excited about what we call like these blue ocean use cases, which are people who are creating new new applications that never existed before. They're they're testing Earth observation to see if it can solve a novel problem in their business. So um, we've worked with uh, movie studios um, who, rather than uh, sending people on planes into remote areas to do uh, like location scouting. We, um, mm -hmm. we they, they're starting to use satellites now to just do. So we've helped um, we, we've helped uh, large movie studios and so, with television shows as well plan where they're going to do location scouting with satellite data rather than rather than them sending a, a private plane into the Amazon, uh, for example, which can be dangerous as well as expensive. Um, we help um, we, we've helped the automotive industry monitor their, their supply chain more effectively. Uh, we obviously, uh, like like many Earth observation companies, played a role in monitoring uh, the eastern Ukraine border uh, border last year um, as as Russia began their invasion of Ukraine. So, um, yeah, you, you know, the, the simple answer is if you can see it from space and you can derive some sort of intelligence from it, our job is to just connect that for you. You know, use us to tell us where. You need something and when you need it by and our job is to figure out which of the hundreds of satellites can do that for you and then just to deliver back an image to you when you need it okay because that that sounds really helpful <laughs> um i mean i work in the research community and i had colleagues who were wanting to look at the arctic because uh, they do arctic research and they're like oh we can't see you know some things are blurred out on google earth but we know there's something there and we want to see it. And I was like, oh, satellite imagery. That would be a great way to, to do it. And I thought that should be easy. And it wasn't easy. Um, I was thinking, oh, you can use RadarSat Constellation. And you know, I set up a user account. I don't know if that's active or not. Um, and then I thought, well, there's so many commercial providers. But you're right, having to look up the commercial provider, explain what you want, try to task us. It, it's a lot of work. Um, in the end, it turned out to be, it, it worked and it turned out to be quite fascinating, uh, but that wasn't easy. And, and you're not, as a non-expert, you're also probably not sure if you got the right, like the best option of all the options that were available in the market, not to mention as we exponentially grow how many satellites or in orbit, it's only going to make that problem for you exponentially harder to solve. Um, yeah. And, and so, yeah. The, the, 
Exactly. And if you, if you need navigation services, you don't like figure out which navigation satellite company can provide it to you because that, that would require you to be an expert. Um, but the goal is to really, I think, good technology fades in the background. Um, and we've done a good job with that in the communication space, in, in, in navigation. And uh, we haven't yet solved that in Earth observation. I think we've, I think Skywatch has solved that and we're growing our impact. But as an industry, we have a long way to go for, for that problem to, to, to fade into the background. Um, so we've sort of been talking about all of the different uses. Um, I might go back to one of the audience questions. Actually, let's go back quickly because you mentioned, I think you said 95% of the pixels collected. So there's a lot of data. And you're pointing to the fact that there's a lot of wasted data. And Rika in the audience has asked a question about building software. Um, I guess some of the unique pipelines that you're developing, maybe to make better use of some of this, I guess, wasted big data. Um, yeah. You know, we talked about this, we used to talk about this in counterterrorism, which is, you know, a weird linkage. Um, but that was in the days when big data was just starting. It was like, yeah, there's all this data, except all the analysts are all picking the same pieces of low hanging fruit when they look at things. And so the ability to make use of the information that was coming in, which to me was not a bad thing that it wasn't being used, but you know, the, I guess the, um, the irony of having so much data is that you often can't use it all. Mm -hmm. uh, the irony of abundance. I'm sure there's a phrase about that. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and not not all data is um, is useful data. And I think that the challenge with having lots of data is obviously finding the signal from the noise. And um, in in Earth observation, we like to call it. It's traditionally called a big data problem, but at Skywatch, we we call it a heavy data problem, which is traditionally big data is about having um, lots and lots of relatively small files, but a large volume of them. So think about like. Text, textual information, but a lot of like text essentially, um, which is like small kilobyte files, um, but but in the many millions of them. Uh, Earth observation has a has a, has a inverse problem of that. Um, not a lot of files per se, um, but really heavy files, 10, 20 gigabyte images that sludge through the the system. Um, you know, they're, they're thousands of times larger than your average file that might be in a, in a more traditional big data system. Um, and so they move through slower. They're also harder to process and to calibrate and, and to make ready for analysis. And so we, we call it like it's like a heavy sludge. It's a, it's a heavy data problem as opposed to a big data problem. It'll soon be a voluminous problem, too. One of the challenges not to get um, not, not to play too much inside baseball here, but that there is. Um, there is a big challenge in getting the volume of data that we want to capture in space down to the ground. Uh, there's certainly many limitations in 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 in, in bottlenecks in being able to downlink data, and um, and part of what we're trying to do in putting software into space is to solve that too. Because if 95 percent of the data is not being used, um, then we don't need to have such a such a bandwidth problem or a bottleneck that 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 we currently have. Uh, the the, the biggest um, contributor to wasteful data, though, in Earth observation is it's a funny one, and it's, 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 it's obvious when you think about it, but it's clouds, right? So it's not, not necessarily useful, but um, we always say our biggest competitor is a cloud um, getting in the way of something that we want to capture. Uh, and, uh, and that's actually the largest contributor. So while it's, um, while it might be, so, so one might think about that 95% and say, well, is there anything you can do that's useful with it? Sometimes, but I would say most of the time, it's it's really clouds. It's really information that that that, that it's actually not information. It, it's just white pixel RGBs um, that, uh, that that don't provide any extra value. Um, so so unfortunately not. The other thing that is very constraining in the industry is that downlinking prices are still relatively expensive and prohibitive for us just collecting data uh, for the sake of it in, in the event that it might be useful down the road. Now, our goal, and, and we work with a lot of our partners on this, is to eventually bring downlinking costs to, to, to being negligible, if, if not um, zero, so that, and there's companies that are not only working on better 
communication technologies, but we're starting to see experimentation with optical communication and laser comms that that could help solve for this. But the um, but the uh, so, sorry, the point I was getting at was uh, lost my train of thought. Um, I like you, you got me at cost and um, lowering the cost of access because right. I do think cost barrier for your vision of you know humanity benefiting so who who can afford to purchase the services who has access those kinds of questions when in so right so so when the cost comes down the, the cost of downlinking the data itself so you got to pay you got to pay a third party provider usually most of the time some companies build their own ground stations but that has costs in and of itself that have to be recouped um but you have to pay usually you pay a third party to downlink your data that's still fairly expensive, meaning that we're not just collecting base maps of the world every single day in all of these different sensor formats and resolutions, right? Um, and, you know, Planet's really the only company doing that, and they're only doing it in a four-band multispectral product at a five meter per pixel range, right? Which is, again, just scratching the surface of the type of imaging that we could possibly do in orbit. Um, but 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 generally speaking, the costs are, are are still prohibitive. You bring that down, yes. I think the, the amount of information we'll be able to capture and just be able to create new base maps of the world almost on a daily basis. I, I think that's the eventual end point here that we get to. I think it's just a question of when we get there. Uh, I wouldn't say it's it's further than a decade away, though. Wow, that's a, a lot happening in a very short amount of time. I'm just looking at the audience questions um, and trying to fit them in as they make sense in the discussion. And we'll we'll take some at the end as well. Um, but Dwayne asked a question about search engine availability for, for data. So is there a pooling of all major satellite databases? Um, and you mentioned that you're often tasking, so you're not working necessarily in historical data. Is that historical data available? Yeah, so the... Um... The, the search engine question is an interesting one. So I think, you, you know, if you want to get access to an aggregate of all of that archive data, um, it's hard to do that as well. There are companies that that actually also do it better than Skywatch at the moment in terms of they, they capture data from a lot of um, open satellites as well. Skywatch operates predominantly in the domain of commercial satellite data, um, but um, the, the organizations that have created the largest archives of satellite imagery and data are, are space agencies and, and NASA and NOAA in particular, um, because they have massive budgets uh, that they don't have to make a profit on to do so. I mean, it's part of their mandate um, with their budget to make that data available. So um, there are many, there are, there are a few organizations out there that help you get access to or query um, some of that free data that's available. Um, the difference between free and commercial primarily is that commercial tends to be um, more high resolute. Uh, the, 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 the image quality uh, or the image resolution, I, sh I should say, is, is more resolute and, um, and tends to be updated more frequently, um, whereas a space agency might have a, a single spacecraft providing maybe weekly revisits. Uh, a commercial company might have a similar capability but providing uh, multi-daily um, or at least multiple times per week uh, revisit rates. Um, however, so so you, you still though need to kind of know what you're looking for um, when you're when you're going to these sites and, and looking for data. The next generation of, of, of like search engine for historical satellite archives is um, probably it's just around the corner. I'm starting to see a little bit of it, uh, a few of these innovations with really, really young companies and groups of people that are just starting to solve these problems. But um, I, I think we're all we've all thought about or tried to use chat GPT in some way in our business. Um, there's some really interesting capabilities that are developing with using natural language to search what you're looking for. Um, so and I actually think it's something that, that, you know, Skywatch could provide very soon, which is somebody it. it, it creates another layer of abstraction for an end user who doesn't want to know or doesn't need to know anything about the space industry, but has a particular problem that they need to solve. And it, I think there's a lot of interesting work happening that, that's using natural language processing to help somebody try to find something in data. And then there's also, uh, in addition to that, uh, we're, we're thinking about ways in which we can start to um, label 
the information or the objects or features that are in all of this imagery across all of these providers so that you can map the, the natural language uh, processing to those features. So it's like, show me, um, show me uh, satellite imagery with military tanks in it within this geography. And you can do that all in natural language. And, and within, within a minutes, you can pull up imagery um, and you don't you need, need to know or care about the source of the imagery. Um, it's just the, the back end of the engine is doing all that work. And, and I honestly think based on what I'm seeing in the market right now and, and some of the customers and partners of which the technology we have access to, I think we're only a few years away from seeing something that could, you could actually use in your business that's that effective. Because that would, I mean, it reminds me kind of of the early days of like Google Photos when it starts tagging things and then you can search um, because we all have thousands and thousands. Your, your, of your personal Google Photos, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, except, oh except in this case, it's not yours. It's like, it's actually the Google image search engine itself that's searching the whole web. And you're like, I need an image of this. And Google figures it out and brings it back to you. Something similar right. will exist for, for satellites. <laughs> So that I think that's a good gateway to two relevant questions um, that I'm taking kind of from mine, but also from the Q&A. So the first, uh, you've mentioned military tanks, and there's a question in the audience about security issues. So do you have processes that you have to follow when it comes to security, or what are the security and ethical challenges or, or approaches that Skywatch adopts? Um, because some images are sensitive. Uh, yeah, absolutely, and it's a it's an uh, it's actually an easy problem in our business. Some some people think that there might be um, large regulatory constraints in, in doing what we do, but the um, the what we, the the things we have to comply with are relatively simple. So uh, the the licensing or the laws that a satellite imagery uh, satellite image has to comply with are subject to the um, governing state of that company, right? So there are, um, if you operate a company in the U.S. and you're producing imagery, there are jurisdictions which you cannot serve that data to, or buy data from. Um, but um, but it's different in Canada. It's different in Europe. It's different in Africa. It's different in the Middle East. But they're fairly well known. So we we have what we call a rules engine that helps us figure out. Um, who can see what and who can access what data. But those rules do exist. They're relatively easy to comply with. Um, we're adding a new layer of difficulty to this problem recently, though. So um, one thing that we did in our business um, that's new in our business this year is we're transitioning to being a self-serve self product. So so historically, you would, you would, to get access to our platform, you would sign up and then um, one of our one of our um, customer facing uh, members would reach out to you and have a conversation with you, and they would verify who you are, and um, and that you know you have a legitimate need for the data, and that you don't sit on some you know do not fly list or, or terrorist watch, watch list, and yeah. um, and you are who you say you are, right? And um, and then we give you you know we, we verify your your identity and we give you access to the platform. Uh, and now we're, we're starting to transition more to a self-serve onboarding experience where people are starting to use and buy data and we've never met them before. So we we run, we, we use now a KYC service, a know your customer or know your client service in which you now have to input your details into, uh, so you can access our platform without, um, without needing this, but once you want to start purchasing data, We'll ask you a few questions uh, to ver verify your identity. We then use a third-party API service that we then send that information to, and they validate that you're not on any blacklists um, and, and that you are who you say you are and return us a, a yes or no as to whether you can continue using the data. So, um, it, you know, it, it, lots of Earth observation laws and regulations are, uh, they're, they're, they 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 were drafted and 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 built with uh, national security in mind because that's that's originally where Earth observation comes from and uh, 
And, and so there's a, there is a lot there that we need to comply with. The rules are fairly simple, but, but they do exist and it is important for us to, in order to keep the trust of, of our providers because we're, Skywatch exposes our providers to that, that risk if we don't handle it appropriately um, because they're the ones who um, get the slap, not, not us, if, uh, if, that, um, if, if, if their data is sold to a nefarious party. Right, and that makes it even more important for you, Ben, who's no one, yeah, no one wants the, to be the, a slap. Exactly. The Ukraine is a really good example where, um, you, you know, in the early days of the war, we felt ourselves really, um, we felt it really important to uh, help anybody uh, within the Ukraine to um, use the data to then uh, search, uh, to, to, to sort of help, you know, build their defenses. But as Russia started to actually control more of the Ukrainian territory, it became a gray area as to whether somebody um, coming in from Ukraine, which side of the war they were on. Um, and, and then the US government, as well as the Canadian government began to um, ask that we don't serve anybody in U Ukraine, regardless of the side they're on, because you couldn't verify whether you were serving uh, Russians or Ukrainians. And, um, and, and, and so it, it's, you know, you can see how even in the midst of war, gray areas start to start to arise that, that make serving either side um, quite, quite difficult. That's a fascinating example. Um, we're gonna veer away from war. <laughs> and uh, there's a question about the use of AI from Adil, who is another fellow Waterlooite. That's the term we use, Waterlooite. Um, and so how is AI changing, not just your business, well, your business, but also the business of Earth observation more broadly? Uh, great right. question. So. Um, uh, AI became, well, satellite imagery became quite um, popular, useful in the public domain in the mid 2000, like I would say 2015 to 2017, because people were starting to take computer vision algorithms and they were using it to automate the object and feature detection of, of, of satellite imagery. We, um, we actually have what we call like more practical uses of AI in our business that um, don't involve creating like really interesting analytics, but they 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 enable us to run our business at scale. So uh, some examples are, and it's actually pretty fundamental to our business. Um, when we started Skywatch, uh, we were the first company in the world to launch uh, an API for commercial satellite data. And what we didn't know getting into the business, this is where the naivete comes in, was that um, the majority, if not all, of the satellite imagery, commercial satellite imagery at that time was manually processed by people at desktop computers and, and before it went out to you. So somebody would literally, uh, we, we've had tours at, at satellite operators, um, businesses and offices where uh, they, they go from, they walk from the server that's collecting the data from the ground station with a thumb drive over to a, a, an office where there's image processing team that then takes that thumb drive, puts it in a desktop and, you know, runs it through some processing software and make sure it's all correct in terms of its spatial accuracy and uh, it's, it band co-registration, orthorectification, the, the millions of things that we do to make sure satellite imagery can, can be analysis ready. And then they like pull out their thumb drive and they walk it back over to the sales team and they say, hey, we got your customer's data ready, it's ready to go. Um, and you find out, you know, processing uh, Earth observation data is extremely complex. And so in our early days, um, a lot of our early innovation was taking some of that, uh, the, the, the processing that was done on the desktop and porting it to the cloud and figuring out how we can do this in an automated way so that a human, so, so that we could process satellite imagery, but a human did not have to uh, actually see it before it went out to, to a customer. And, and so there, there's tons of, of corner cases um, around that, whether it's uh, what we call uh, using like ground control points to do spatial accuracy. I'll give you like one example, right? So um, as satellites have gotten much uh, smaller in size, they've become uh, and become much and, and have gone into much lower orbits. Uh, they become subject to much more atmospheric uh, turbulence when they're imaging. And so generally, we see a lot of imagery that uh, it's it, the, the spatial 
units that we're giving, like the lot long coordinates for the imagery that we're given, can be a, a, as far off as 100 meters from the actual lot long of the image itself. So the gyroscope is on the spacecraft, it, it, it has a hard time calibrating accurately where the satellite is taking an image of the Earth. And so this is like a great example of why satellite imagery is, is processed manually. You, you would put it on your desktop, you would upload it to Google Earth, and you would manually move the image around and make sure that the roads align and the buildings align, and then you would reset the lat long coordinates of the imagery, and then you would say it's done. So it's like, how do you do that? So you use AI, right? You try to outline the road, you try to outline some of the what we call ground control points at the key um, features in that image, and then we grab a base map automatically, and we try to align the two, and, and then we you know reset the the lat long coordinates of the image, and then ship it out to the customer. It's a really hard problem, and in, until you actually understand that problem exists, you don't understand why this imagery is done so you know has, has been done manually all these years. So AI plays a huge role in our business, and a lot of those things that we call like practical problems. But not like the sexy problems in the industry. They're like the things that actually make this industry work at scale. Um, and then another um, another example of AI. We recently announced a, a contract that we have with the Canadian Space Agency. We're uh, we're building uh, AI for autonomous space systems. So um, at the the other thing that's growing more challenging in the space industry is as we move to larger and larger constellations of satellites. Um, there, it's no longer practical for a human to manage the operations of all those satellites. And so um, what we've built a lot of AI for in our business and what we're trying to build for the Canadian government uh, is artificial intelligence that can say, uh, take a, that with one satellite will identify a wildfire and then automatically know what instructions to give to other satellites in a network or constellation to do follow-up observations on. So you're starting to see these space systems will become more and more autonomous themselves and need less and less input from human beings. And again, I think that's something that, that'll be really transform the industry by the end of this decade. Um, so so a, autonomous space systems is gonna become a, a real thing. And uh, it's another area where AI is playing a huge role. Um, I so, so I was smiling as you were talking about processing the images because I realized that this is what we were trying to do at, um, I was with my kids last summer, we were lucky enough to go to Paris on a family vacation and we were in the science museum and it was fascinating, they have a whole space section there, but one of them was trying to line up the um, the earth observation images so they have a whole they have a whole section on earth observation and how how it's used and i just realized that that's what we were trying to do and that was really frustrating and we gave up and walked away and so the fact that that is so much easier now <laughs> i'm just I'm, like whoo maybe they need to update that <laughs> i'm partially okay. joking but that could actually be a real satellite company that's outsourcing their their spatial calibration to kids at a museum like it's, it, that's possibly how they're solving it, it wouldn't surprise me um, so that was a fascinating real life, but also, you know, um, frustrating experience that you discussed. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to pick and choose. We have a few minutes left. Um, there's a lot of questions. You're inspiring people. Um, Tenniel Youssef is joining. I know she's joining us from London, and I'm going to say the other London, the one in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and she's asked about licensing and how, I mean, I'm not sure as the middle operator, do you have to deal with the licensing agreements and restrictions? And part of that you might have spoken to when you talked about the, how each country has its own rules and regulations. Yeah, I would say licensing is, um, it is the, one of the, like, the largest um, pains in our side. Uh, it's, uh, it's a, it, it, we have a very inner observation, a very antiquated uh, licensing regime and um and we're we've um you know if you go to skywatch.com or if you go to our linkedin and you look at some of our posts from earlier this year um we we've made a, a, a public declaration that any company that's launching their satellite using uh, our product TerraStream, which is our shopify for space companies um we're we, we're gonna our default is going to be to to use a very modern open licensing regime that doesn't because uh, right now licensing i i think the best example i can give the best analogy that can be well understood is the music industry 
And, and if you think about what licensing looked like in a pre-Spotify world, like a pre-streaming world versus what it looks like today, um, satellites are still focused on selling their data like on a per track basis. And um, and while users are trying to move towards a streaming world and um, the licensing regimes there are making that extremely difficult, they don't match how customers actually want to consume and utilize the data. Yeah. Some of the new companies are, um, are doing a much better job of addressing this and we're personally trying to play a role in it. Uh, it's again, it's like one of these, there's such a great, uh, awesome motivating industry. It's one of the more unsexier topics that's actually holding the industry back. Um, licensing, boring, but um, playing a, a very large role, I think, in um, slowing the growth and, and the potential of our industry. So um, without getting all the details, it's a great question, a very um, timely one, and, uh, uh, it, it, and it's a problem. And uh, I think um, we're, we're trying to open it up as much as we can. So I'm going to pull together some themes that are running through some of the questions, uh, which are really focused, I think, on usability and accessibility, which uh, in my mind are kind of the two pillars of Skywatch and, and the fact that there's more and more data available. So do you see a point, and I think you were speaking to this, but you know, a point when maybe not a company, but someone like me um, might be able to use common language as you were speaking to, um, because I don't, I don't do programming and I don't, I don't understand code. I don't know how to speak to computers. Um, to easily look something up, um, I guess having that that sense of EO in your pocket um, type thing for you know not a large scale organization, but perhaps individuals totally. trying to solve problems or researchers trying to solve problems. Absolutely. So I, I like to say that we, we all already have EO in our pocket and it's called the weather, the weather app and a weather forecast. Um, again, you, you take it for granted though, right? Like you're just like, oh, like weather, um, I use it every day. Uh, it's even though it's derived from many satellite based instruments, uh, it's something that we just don't even think about. But it's Earth observation, it is observing the Earth and, and it's very components to, to provide a useful service to us every day. Um, I, I think like what has to evolve likely is vertical specific applications. So your organization and what you guys do, it would be an app, it would be an application that's probably very like the algorithms of the natural language processing is very specific to the problems you need to solve in your business. And the solution will look slightly different than it looks in agriculture, in insurance, et cetera. But but it, it it will like that. That's ultimately what this looks like, and I don't think we're very far away from that. Where you might have a security question, um, and, um, and and you'll have a natural language processing capability that will be modeled off of security questions and answers specifically. That will then pull data from sources that they know can service security needs. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that'll become, I, I think you'll interface with it that way. And who knows, you might not even receive imagery in the, in, in the future. You might just receive answers to your questions. Um, we find people, people fantasize about this idea a lot, which is like, it's about, it's about insights, not about data. I still think customers, you know, you yourself will want in order to trust the answer you're getting you'll probably still want to see the image as, as you know you don't want to just take for granted that this piece of ai that you don't know how how it was built is giving you um this information that could you know mean in some instances life or death and uh and you have to make a decision on it uh you're going to want the verifying data to, to accompany it but yeah i i, I think we're, we're pretty close trust is key um i know we're we're supposed to end soon, but I do want to take one more question that I think pulls it again at some of these themes. Um, is there any talk in the industry yet about the ability to manipulate imagery or about this, the security of data itself? I guess that might be the way to put it. And, um, you know, I've, I've heard things about fake geography or I guess the veracity of data and how, how do yeah. you tackle the veracity of data and, and maintain that trust? Yeah, it's, it's a very, uh, it's a novel question uh, it, and, and a timely one too. 
Uh, it's one that I'll admit, like, we don't have an answer to at this moment, but we're cognizant that we're probably the company that, that is going to have to be responsible uh, for this uh, veracity or, or verification. The, you know, you know, I think what we take solace with right now is that we're working directly with a partner um, who we trust, and, and there's not many of them in space, so generally anyone who's operating assets in, in orbit today is a, is a well, thoroughly vetted uh, company. And we access their data repositories as well as pass their satellites directly and distribute that data as is out to customers. But um, th there, this infrastructure will be subject to, if not already, subject to cybersecurity risks. And um, and it is a, uh, it, it, there's, I think, a lot of concerns around what happens if, uh, especially with uh, the creation of synthetic data being so easy. What if somebody manipulates the data in its um, in, in the archives? It can cause massive, massive problems. So, uh, especially like imagine a world where let, let's take like something not as deadly, but but as, as dangerous. Um, not not dangerous in like a, a, a physical sense, but more in an economic sense. Um, imagine a world where space data is directly integrated into a, autonomous um, farming machines. And somebody creates an algorithm that all of a sudden uh, suggests that all these crops are are dry and they need, but they're not, they're healthy, but they're dry and they need lots of water and fertilization. And they actually insert malicious uh, software or algorithms into the, in the, into the ecosystem that changes the output of the data so that all of a sudden these autonomous farm systems are actually ruining crops that were, that were already healthy and at a mass scale um extremely scary stuff uh i i don't have the answer it, it is a pressing problem um and i think it's one we're going to have to get ahead of the the risks aren't massive yet because this infrastructure is not well tied together yet that's kind of like one of the the benefits i guess of, of this infrastructure having been so difficult to access is that um is that the uh, it's hard to have like have this damage happen at a mass scale? But if Skywatch does a good job of pulling all this infrastructure together, um, the the cybersecurity risks and the vulnerabilities then um, become quite uh, um, quite compelling for those who, who want to um, introduce those uh, it, exploit those vulnerabilities. Yes, and at Plowshares, we do a lot of work, my, my colleague Bronca Marion, on autonomous weapons. And so what you describe it in more deadly sense is something that I think we're we're starting to think about um, and yeah. you've made it more real. And you guys <laughs> have also that. you guys have also talked, I think, quite a bit at, at Plowshares about the um the exploitation of, of cybersecurity vulnerable vulnerabilities in space, but for the sort of like the taking over of the spacecraft itself and perhaps you know leading to um, disastrous events in orbit which is a, which is a different challenge but a, a challenge uh, nonetheless yeah the more that's more the black swan the um mm -hmm. very dangerous but less likely outcome whereas the the things you describe so are... kessler effect yes but but what you describe is very much more likely i would think and yeah. uh, and more. I don't want to yeah, end on absolutely. a dark note uh, because <laughs> I think you know, that, uh, you know when I try to inspire people about space and why we need to value space, the work that you're doing, um, Earth observation data, how we use it. There's questions in the chat about its role for climate change mitigation. I mean, these are the stories that we need to start telling so that people understand why space is so valuable, why space needs to be protected, and why we invest in outer space. Um, as a country and also globally and why we cooperate uh, with one another. Um, so before I go and say goodbye, we're not going to say goodbye quite yet because we are going to hand it back to Space Watch. But, you know, I took a list of things that um, Skywatch is or is becoming. And I have the, the Shopify of EO data. I have the Spotify of EO data and I have the iPhone. And I think these are all That's cool. really exciting things to live up to. And uh well-known brand so i'm familiar yeah. with so much but i'm looking forward to the day when you know um people start talking about the skywatch of space and and maybe being the skywatch of some other kind of space data so, um, so so let me so take the, 
I was going to say, we think the opportunity to build um, software for space is, is could, you could build the, probably the most valuable company in space. Um, so it's something that makes space assets more valuable to, to everybody here on Earth. I think uh, it's something everyone, you know, probably uh, worth, I encourage more people to get involved. People always ask, you know, do you have a lot of competition? And I always want more people to get in, you know, help grow this pie, help, help make space technology um, more and more important to our everyday lives. Okay, well, you've all heard the challenge, <laughs> which is to do this. Um, and I'll just, before I hand it back to, to, to Space Watch, say that's, um, you know, it's a really good plug for Waterloo Region, where we do software incredibly well. And um, why not start building more software that makes use of space and that makes space more valuable? Uh, totally. So with that, I will hand the controls over. We will say goodbye together with, with our friends at Scott Space Watch. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica, and thank you, James. Before we say goodbye, let me remind you of the upcoming events. So our team, Emma and Jorsten, will be um, from the 4th to the 6th of June in London for Financial Times Investing in Space Conference. If you'd like to attend, we can do offer uh, you, to you special discounts, so don't miss this opportunity. We will also be at Space Comps. And mark your calendar for the next Space Cafe 33 minutes um, and uh, stay tuned for our special guest. And this will happen on the 13th of June at 4 p.m. And then on the 16th of June at 4 p.m. again, Central European time, as always, we have our Space Cafe Austria by Sabine Pongruber. And on the 22nd at 3 p.m., uh, our Space Cafe Brazil by Ian Grosner. All events, um, are, well, I forgot to mention that on the 29th, it's taking place the next space bar, the 65th space bar by Astro Agency. All events are going to be online on Eventbrite. And as always, we will love to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up for our daily and our bi-weekly newsletters. And if you like to treat yourselves with something special, become a space watcher today or help us in the supporter program. Thank you all very much for your interest today. Thank you, Jessica, for hosting that inspiring talk. Thanks again to the entire team behind the scenes for doing this great job week in week again. Thank you all, all to our dear audience who engaged greatly today. So thank you for joining us. I hope you, I hope to see you in upcoming events. In the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. And don't forget, become a space watcher. Bye, thank you.